Um, so this is a presentation that I gave over at Pi Ohio 2019. So if you'd like to see another version of this, if you'd like to see the version that I don't screw up quite as much, uh, <laughs> that would be the one to see. But uh, yeah, that, so I'll be talking about a book that I've been writing called The Mediocre Programmer. Uh, and I'll talk about the story of where that title came from at near the end of it. So hello, I'm Craig Maloney. I've been yakking at you for about a half hour. Uh, <laughs> so if you head on over to the website, themediocreprogrammer.com, you can find copies of the book that I've been writing and also the glorious artwork that I got uh, from David Revois. Um, he's an amazing artist. Check out his comic, Pepper and, Can and Carrot, uh, com. Anyways, so why the mediocre programmer? Well, first off, I'd like to ask you a question. How do you fly an airplane? Well, there are many ways to fly an airplane. When you're younger, this is the way that you fly an airplane. You fold a piece of paper, you fold it just right, you know, someone teaches you a little bit how to fold it, and then you get that little snap at the very end of it, you just throw it, boom, you're flying an airplane. So that's one way to fly an airplane. All right, so how do you fly a commercial airplane? Well, that's a little trickier. What you do is you twiddle those knobs, you flip those switches in just the right order, you read the dials and it's just a certain way, you know, make sure that all the things are pointing in the right direction. Yeah. And then your customer shows up, checks in you from time to time, make sure that everything is okay. Yeah, and that's how you fly an airplane. Yeah, I have absolutely no idea on how to fly a commercial airplane, I apologize. But what I mean by mediocre, because I don't know necessarily how to fly an airplane, but yeah, you know, I have no skill in that. What I mean by mediocre, in the game Fate and Fudge, there is a scale, a ladder, and where you are at unskilled is mediocre. So you'll see on the line over there where it says zero and mediocre. That is an unskilled person. That is someone who is unskilled. So when I talk about mediocre, I mean someone who is unskilled. You're not necessarily bad at it. You're not necessarily horrible at it. You're also not great at it yet. You're just unskilled. You have a ways to go at this. So when I talk about flying an airplane, beginners learn a lot of basic concepts using a subset of skills on limited projects. So you'll get something, you know, it's like, okay, all you need to do in order to become a programmer, you just type print hello world, you do a little addition and subtraction, and there you go, you're a programmer now. Yay, you're a programmer. And I don't want to discount that, but there's a difference between some of that and then getting to the point where you're an advanced user. And advanced users have a wide range of skills learned by many hours of practice on complex systems. So, you know, in order to fly an airplane, you got to make sure you get the pitch, yaw, roll, all that other stuff is in the right alignment so that you're flying. So, what happens though when you're no longer a beginner, and what happens when you're not quite advanced? And that is, I've termed it, well, the distance in, uh, between skilled and unskilled, I've termed the gap. And no, it's not a clothing store. This is the distance, this is my term for the distance between getting from where you are right now to getting to where you want to be. And we try and close these gaps. Gaps are usually something that is imposed by someone else. It's usually something where you are, um, you realize, hey, I don't have this particular set of skills. So that's something, you know, that the world has imposed upon you. You want to try and close those gaps as much as you can. So how do you close all the gaps? Well, I have some bad news for you. You can't close all of the gaps. There are usually um, things that you just will not be able to close, but you have to pick what it is that you want to uh, concentrate on. You do have options, though, for how to deal with those gaps, and those options are the following. First option is don't try and close the gaps. Stick with what you know and let it ride. That is an awesome option. Um, it's not necessarily a great option, though, for a long-term career. The second option is one that I know very well, which is where you buy everything, you read everything, you watch everything, you try and do everything. You basically take O'Reilly.com and No Starch Press and Pragmatic Programmers and try and shovel that all into your head, book by book, as much as you possibly can. That is not a good long-term solution. <laughs> that is a great way to get burned out and become frustrated. Even though they're great folks, I love those publishers did pieces, that is a, a great way to get burned out. 
Option three is where you start with small tasks, you work toward clearly defined goals, and you enjoy the journey. Guess which one I'm going to recommend? <laughs> because with option one, you have no progress. There's no progress in, in just sticking with what you know. The second option, there's no hope of completion. Whereas the third option gives you progress in small steps of completion. I'm going to honor the Wright brothers. This presentation happened over in Ohio, and of course, Ohio is the birthplace of flight. Sorry, North Carolina, you just happen to have the airfield. The Wright brothers took from 1896 to 1903 to get where they could fly their first airplane. So that was seven years of them tinkering away in their bike shop, making uh, of a tinkering, experimentation, frustration, mistakes, and failure. And that flight lasted 59 seconds and 852 feet. 852 feet, uh, for those of you who count things in playable area of football fields, is 284 yards, or almost three football fields. But they kept trying, they kept working at it. And so I honor them. I wish there was an overnight solution for becoming a better programmer. But unfortunately, there is not an overnight solution. I wish there was a way you could learn the totality. It's like the Matrix. We had that little thing in the back. You, know, you just plug it in the back of your head, and boom. You know, you have, you know, I know jujitsu. Uh, I wish there was a way to do that. But unfortunately, there is not yet. So I use the metaphor of a journey in the book. And the reason I use the metaphor of a journey is that everyone has a different journey. Everyone has a different path for which they go in order to get to their destination. Programming is not a factory. And I wish people would stop using this metaphor where you just take a programmer, you run them through this gauntlet of stuff, and then boom, out comes another pro a programmer, a better programmer on the other end of it. A journey, you know, for most programmers, it just, you just kind of meander away through. And it's like, this looks interesting. This looks interesting. I want to go over here. I want to do this. And so you're going to have good days, and you're going to have bad days on that journey as you progress. So it's a journey. <clears throat> So this is a journey, then what do you want for your journey? What do you want to take with you on your journey? Well, one thing that you'll want to take are good companions on your journey. You'll want to have good traveling companions. They don't necessarily need to be with us in person. They can be through books. They can be through videos. They can be online. They can be in meetups like this particular meeting. We just need to have folks that we can take along with us and who can help us on our journey. So. One thing to realize is that all programmers are your peers. <coughs> Even the most skilled programmers out there are your peers. And once you realize that, it becomes very liberating. You get the sense that you can ask questions of just about anyone. Whether they'll be able to respond to you is another, a different matter altogether. Um, but if you start thinking about them as peers, you start to strip away some of the fear of asking other people questions as you move along and asking advice. So once you realize that you're not competing with other programmers, you can then leverage their talents as well. You know, all of us have different talents and different things that interest us. Some of us are interested in embedded programming. Some of us are interested in back-end programming, front-end programming, whatever it is, whatever tickles your fancy. You can find different companions to help you along on your journey. <coughs> So I got a lot of advice on finding a good community in the book. Um, huh? Please read it. Thank you. So there are traps along the way. Because it's a journey, there's going to be traps. One of those traps is the backstage versus the performance, comparing your rehearsal to the highlight reels of others. We are unreliable narrators of our experiences. And we tend to edit out the, edit out the not terribly interesting parts of our experiences. You highlight the parts that worked out very well, the parts that made very interesting stories, and you tend to leave out all the embarrassing failures, unless they're really good embarrassing failures. And it's like, ooh, you know, I did something really, really silly, and I want you all to know about it. But that can be frustrating when you take a look at your own work, all the stuff that you're doing, and then compare it to someone else's highlight reel. You know, if you go on social media and it's like, oh, I'm having a great day programming here over at Microsoft, blah, 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 or I'm having a great day doing this stuff. And it's like you may feel like you're not worthy of being a programmer. So be careful when you compare your backstage to someone else's performance. And that term, backstage versus performance, comes from, 
I think it's originally from comedy. It's also from theater as well. The idea that you know all the flaws in your own per particular performance. You know where all the duct tape is. You know where the set design looks like crap. You know where all the stuff does not work very well versus someone else's very polished performance. You know, or you don't see all the crap that's going on behind it in their scenes either. Another thing to be careful of is online ranking systems. And I'm going to pick on Hacker Rank in particular because Hacker Rank, anytime that you take something, you and put a number to it, you turn it into a game. And there are people who will optimize for a particular game. And if that game is solving puzzles online to get points or Wuffy or whatever the heck it is, then there are going to pe be people who are going to optimize whatever it is that they're doing so that they can get a better number, a better score on that. And the problem is those numbers are meaningless. It's akin to grading folks on how many crossword puzzles they can do. There are some people who do very well at crossword puzzles who will do, you know, spend an entire afternoon doing a New York Times crossword puzzle. To me, stuff like hacker rank is just doing crossword puzzles. It doesn't really give you a useful metric. And the problem is a lot of places that hire will use something like a hacker rank or something like that to give you a whole bunch of puzzles in order to try and solve. So be careful, be careful with that. I'm going to talk a little about the M word. And I know nobody really likes to talk about making mistakes, especially when you're doing something, um, when you're programming, especially you're programming for a client. You don't necessarily want to make mistakes in front of them. But the problem is we don't really give a whole lot of attention for how to make mistakes and how to, do, how to really make mistakes. Because the problem is making mistakes are part of how we make, stuff, uh, make uh, something positive. You will make mistakes. You will make mistakes no matter what you try and do. Even if you try and avoid making mistakes, you may make a mistake to avoid making the mistake. Mistakes are part of how we learn. We cannot help but make mistakes while we're programming. The problem, though, is when we start getting afraid of making mistakes. The fear of making mistakes, uh, where we start fretting about you know, using the language wrong. We start <coughs> worrying about breaking the build or not having tests pass and, you know, and, and having those red signs, you know, it's like, oh, I broke the build, I broke the test, you know, or some other stuff like that. We worry a lot about that type of stuff. And again, that's part of our fear of our performance, how we're performing in front of other folks. We always, and the problem is you're, you need to make those mistakes. And you need to do so in a very controlled way of, uh, of learning. Because you need, to, uh, you need to make the best mistakes. And let me show you how to do that. You need somewhere safe that you can make those mistakes. First thing you need to do is you need to make a model. And <clears throat> models can be anything from a development environment, a virtual machine, virtual environment, something along those lines where you have an ability that you can test out code and you can test out different things in order to make those mistakes as quickly as possible and as frequently as possible in order to understand the concepts. So we can make a model of our production environments that would be really helpful because then you can play around with your production environment and say, okay, not necessarily in production, as like a lot of us do, where you start screwing around with something on production and then you know production breaks. You need to have somewhere where your consequences are minimized. So there's a question about the fidelity of the model though. So you'll see on the top, you have a perfectly serviceable SOP with camel model. If you want to see what it looks like, if you want to see, you know, kind of the dimensions of a sop with camel, uh, kind of the general shape of a sop with camel, that's a good model. But if you want to actually fly a sop with camel in a model scale, the bottom model is going to be much more, has much more fidelity than the top model. And so you need to figure out the balance between either of those models. You know, if you're, if you're trying to figure out, you know, whether our database is working or something like that, maybe you need to copy over enough of that particular database into your development environment so that you can play with them. So you'll need to figure out how much, how fi uh, much fidelity you need. And, you know, you may be able to get away with something like that if you're going to fly a SOP with camel. <laughs> you know, you just need a little something to, to <coughs> screw your imagination, whatever. You want your model to be effective enough that you can use it to make mistakes with the lowest amount of penalty. And then you, too, can be a flying ace. Another way you can mitigate your mistakes is via time machines. And this gets into stuff like version control. 
and the ability to roll back. So if you had the ability to go back in time and move and undo a mistake, that's one way to do it. So it also takes some discipline. And one thing that version control unfortunately gets us into is you want to make sure that you have one single commit or you want to have one particular you know, atomic quote unquote commit or one snapshot. And the problem with that is that I think you need to do a little bit more frequent stuff. So maybe you need to, instead of worrying about getting an atomic commit, maybe you work on your particular branch, do all that stuff, and then maybe make a separate commit that you put out into the rest of the world. So give yourself the freedom to do frequent commits and frequent snapshots. And again, mistakes are, are, and practice are part of the learning process. A good model and a good way to roll back is going to be key for helping you recover from mistakes and make those mistakes. I'm going to talk a little bit about fear and uncertainty, um, which are recurring characters in this particular tale. A lot of programming comes with overcoming fear and uncertainty, especially the fear and uncertainty of failure. We fear that we're not good enough or that we'll let others down. We fear uncertain that things will work out the way that we hope. But if we give ourselves areas where we can practice and we can gain more confidence in our abilities, then that'll help us out. Also, whenever I, f I find myself in a situation where I'm afraid and uncertainty, I also know that there's a gap in my knowledge and that I only do address that later on. So again, tying it all back to gaps. So one way to get better at learning is to keep a journal. I don't do this nearly as well as I should, um, and I'm sure a lot of you probably don't as well, but I have a program that I use called Journal, um, J-R-N-L that I use that I'll just type in little notes and such. Um, but the idea is not necessarily to, to make a perfect record of it. It's just so that I can get it out of my head and get it onto a page so that later on I can refer to it, but mostly so that I can serialize my thoughts so that I can get that onto the page so I can think about what it is that I have done and then get that onto the page as quickly as possible. So keeping a journal is a really great habit. I need to do better at it. Again, making mistakes. We can also get better at learning by sharing our successes and failures. And this can be anything from a particular a blog, we can have a Slack channel, something along those lines where you're sharing with other folks and letting other folks know, hey, you know, this is something that I tried and it, and it worked, great, or it didn't work, boo. And that also will allow you to serialize your thoughts so that you can get them out of your head and figure out you know, it, as part of your learning process, you can then say, okay, this is going to help me better because I, I remember how this particular thing did. And it'll also help you to remember, oh, I was in this situation at one point because I had to write this particular thing down. And that will also allow you to better remember those successes and failures. I think we think of programming as a solo activity. And yes, Programming does require a lot of solace. Uh, I know myself, whenever I want to be in the zone, I'll usually put on my headphones and I'll listen to some very angry death metal music. Uh, but we also need to recognize that we're not alone in all of this stuff, that there are others that can help us. So we need to leverage others in our, in our programming practice. So now that we know how to share our, ex our experiences, let's talk a little bit about the discomfort and fear in programming. So one thing that has helped me to practice with fear and discomfort is um, it also helped me write this book as well. And this is a practice container, uh, or just a container. And what it is, some people may call it a, the Pomodoro technique, trademark. Um, or you just call it like a, a focus container. Basically, you set a timer um, and work through a particular task. And you put your focus on that particular task. So what you do is you start with the intention. So you give yourself an intention when you are working on that particular task. And not necessarily some grand intention. It can be something as simple as, I'm just going to focus on this particular piece of work for the next 10 minutes. You know, something very simple. You don't necessarily have to have it like, I'm going to complete, I'm completely debug this. That may be fiction by, you know, minute eight, that you're going to be able to completely debug whatever it is that you're working on. So at least say, I'm going to focus on this particular piece of, of code. Close out everything but this task. And this is very hard for some of you, I know. But the idea is 
You don't need your email to help you work on something. You don't need your social media to help you work on something. You don't need your chat window to help you focus on something. You don't need all of this stuff. So ideally, you just take this, put it in airplane mode if you want, turn it off if, you are, if you feel brave, you know, but basically shut it off. So that it's not, you're not being distracted by that during that focus container. So now all that exists is you and your work. So then when you're ready to go, you set the timer. And again, I suggest 10 minutes as a good starting point, but you can go as low as five, you can go as high as 25, 30 minutes, whatever you need in order to get into that focus state, do so. And you may want to ramp it up a bit as well, you know, start with 10 minutes and then say, okay, I've been doing 10 minute containers now for quite some time. Maybe I need to bump it up to 12, 15, however you want to go. But I'd say 10 is a good, is a good one for me. Once that timer starts, you are fully immersed in the work. Fully immersed in the work. Not fully immersed and then checking over and seeing what the chat window is doing over there. That's already closed, by the way. No, you just need to make sure that you are fully focused in the work. Be present with the work. The work may be challenging. You may suddenly realize uh, that you have something else that needs your attention at that very moment no matter what it is. You may be is like, oh, you know, there was that email that I was waiting for. Or someone might have said something very funny on the Twitters, you know, that I need to, to need to figure out. No, be present with what it is that you're doing. If you manage to get something, it's like, oh, I need to think about this particular other thing, write it down on a piece of paper, and then get back to work. Just make sure that you are in that moment, you are focused on what it is that you're working on, okay? And again, your mind will suddenly become very chatty all of a sudden. So quiet it down and focus on the work. Be present with the work. And again, you may also have other external things. I don't know what it is about trying to focus that brings things like bosses, cats, <laughs> telemarketers, any sort of distraction, you know. I, I, I'll sit down and it's like, okay, I'm going to focus on something and all of a sudden Pixel will be like, hello. How are you? Did you remember that you have a cat, you know? <laughs> no, I didn't remember. Uh, <laughs> so yes, anything will try and come up and, and try and distract you. So notice those and notice your tendency to try and run away from that. And then move your focus back to your work. When the timer's up, you close out the work as much as you are able and, and can. And then it's a good time to hit save, maybe even a commit. Just saying. Take a deep breath and then relax for just a little bit. And I'm going to show you how to relax, too. Yeah. So take a break. Give yourself a break. And I'm not just saying take one of those little half-ass breaks where you just open up your email and just kind of putter around through that or open up chat. I mean, actually get up and take a break. How do you take a break? Here's a short course on how to take a break. First thing is you move away from the desk as you are willing and or able to do so. So move away from the desk just a little bit. Give yourself some coffee. Use these little things down here, you know, as much as you are willing and are able to. Uh, move away from the desk. And sometimes that may be hard. I know there are certain office environments where if your butt's not in the chair, then they get very fidgety. Uh, they, they worry that you're not doing any particular work. You know, if, if moving away from the desk is just looking away from your screen just for a second, just noticing, you know, that there's cobwebs up there or whatever, just give yourself the ability to take a break. And the idea is to t give yourself a context switch. So if you're looking at the screen all the time, you're not giving yourself, your brain, that context switch. And the idea of a context switch is that you need to have your brain works best when it has the ability to not focus on one particular thing at a given time. And so a context switch, have you ever noticed when you walk in between rooms, there's a certain phenomenon that, that they've talked about um, in some of the psychology stuff, where if you move into another room, you start forgetting what it is that you went into the other room. And that, the idea of that is the context switch. You give your brain the ability to just swap out whatever it is that it doesn't need. So allow yourself that context switch. And I look at it as a reward and take the break. It's so you worked for, you know, 10 minutes, however much it was, 
give yourself that reward. Breaks are not interruptions. I know a lot of folks like to think of a break as, you know, I, I can't take a break. I'm busy. I'm doing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Breaks are part of your work. Breaks are your way for your mind to recharge and get back into the swing of things. So if you're not giving yourself breaks, you're going to, you're going to burn yourself out. And that's a horrible place to be. I'm going to talk a little bit more about distractions because I think they're important. And I think part of the reason that we're so att attached to things like email and social media, instant messaging, uh, chat programs, is our fear of missing out. Our fear that we're going to be blindsided by whatever happens to be in there and that we need to be ready for whatever it is. Um, so if we're not always connected, we might not be available. Someone needs us, you know, uh, then we may not be available. Uh, <clears throat> another thing is that, you know, we might be missing out on the news or events of the world. Something might blow up on Twitter and it's like, we, you know, we may have to ask someone, what the heck happened to here? Why is this hashtag here? You know, so there's a lot of, of fear of missing out. And one of the ways that we can help ourselves is to just give ourselves those containers of focus. And then if you want to take a break, if you want to, you know, putter around on Twitter or whatnot, go ahead and do so. Give yourself a little bit of that wild abandon. But give yourself the focus in that moment and make yourself more resilient to distraction. Programming also requires flexibility. I'm going to make everyone feel old for a second. Yeah. Um, in 2012, the Raspberry Pi was introduced. That was, what, eight, nine years ago? Seven years ago? Sorry, I can do math, really. Uh, so that was seven years ago. In the 2010s, we've seen the rise and release of Rust, Elm, Elixir, TypeScript, Kotlin, and Reason. Those are all new languages that have come out in the 2010s. We'll probably see more by the time the decade is out. So we need to be flexible. I mean, what worked? You know, Java Java's an old language now. Java's really old. C is probably older than I am. <laughs> in one way or another. BCPL, yeah. So, I mean, Unix is slightly older than I am. It's celebrated as, what, its 50th anniversary? I know, yeah, it's like, it's 50 years old in that. You know, hooray for Unix. But we need to be flexible in what we learn. And so, here's how to learn. I'm going to teach you how to learn. So, one of the best things that we can do is learn how to learn. Now, some of us can sit with videos or books, you know, and be able to learn. But the idea is that we need to figure out what works best for us. Because not every one of us learns in the same way. Despite what our school teachers taught us, all of us learn in different ways. And that's where the practice container can help out, is that you can practice with some of the stuff and figure out what works for you. And so you can schedule a time and say, okay, I'm going to sit and read this particular book, okay? And I'm going to focus on that. And so when I did, um, when I was learning some stuff, I, w I tried learning um, Django. And so what I would do is I would sit for a practice container for 10 minutes and just read through a particular book. Um, and it was great because I, I kept with that repetition. And I felt that I found that I needed a lot of repetition. And so the, the practice container, once, you know, agreeing once a day, hey, I'm going to work on this particular thing for 10 minutes a day, helped me out. And it was a lot better than me trying to schedule, you know, oh, I'm going to work on this for an hour. Because that never happens. I'm sorry. We're, life will get in the way of trying to schedule like one, two, ten hours or whatever to try and learn something. So one way to learn how to learn is to make a list of all the stuff that you want to learn and then decide on what you want to learn at that moment. And if you're having trouble deciding, there are a few things that you can do. Uh, one thing you can do is you can roll a die. Number them all, one to six, you know, one to ten, one to twenty, whatever it is. And if you happen to be a role-playing person, you know, roll a 1d20 and figure out what you want to learn. You could also write a program. You know, they all come with randomizers in there. So shuffle a list and then pop off the first one off the list. That Boom, that's what you're going to learn. Okay? <clears throat> Focus on learning one thing at a time. And I am horrible about this because it's like, oh, you know, there's all these wonderful, brilliant things that I want to learn. So I will just try and learn just a little bit of everything. That never works. Focus on learning one thing at a time. So again, pick one thing to learn you know, however you want to do that, and then focus on learning that one particular thing. And let the others rest for that particular moment, okay? You're only going to focus on that one thing. 
focus and use learn one learning tool at a time and use that tool for a week. I am really bad about whenever I want to learn a particular topic going over to pragmatic programmers, no starch press and buying all the stuff. Humble bundles are great for this too. You know, it's like, oh, it's the Humble Bundle Python bundle where you can get all the stuff for 20 bucks. Boom. Okay. Focus on it, just one of those particular things. Okay. So if there's a book out there, you know, that you managed to pick up, focus on reading that book at, at one time, watching that video, learning through that course, you know, going into Demi or Audacity, whatever. Focus on that one thing for one time, for one week. Use one of them at a time and use it for a week. He said stutteringly. The goal is learning, not building a library. I need to have this framed <laughs> because I have got a library full of stuff uh, where I have comparison shopped, where I've gone online and it's like, oh, this, you know, what's the top 10 programming books for this particular topic? You know, I'll buy all of them. That is not how you learn. That is how you build a library. And I don't want to necessarily be a curator of all the good programming books that are out there. You may have a different opinion on that, but I'm trying to get out of that business. So, and if you pick up a bad one, and I know everyone has this fear, it's like, I'm gonna pick up a horrible book on, on this particular topic, and I'm not gonna learn anything. Even the bad ones will at least teach you what a bad programming book looks like, number one. And number two, they may have some stuff in there, and it's like, okay, here's what I'm going to look for in the next book, next course that I'm going to pick up next week okay but just focus for that moment on that one particular book that you have you haven't picked you haven't wasted your your time so there's going to be discomfort while you learn and we talked about discomfort in the programming process but there's also discomfort in the learning process you're putting yourself in a vulnerable and uncomfortable place whenever you're learning something new and that's something that you need to practice with because again, you're 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 rewiring your not your neurons and whatnot into new and exciting patterns while you're learning, and you're also worried if it's going to be successful, if you're going to get a job off of this particular thing. You know, is, is, will this be a failure? Will it be too difficult for me to grasp? You know, discomfort is natural and part of this process, but you need to also be able to kind of work through that discomfort in order to learn what it is that you're learning. Be okay with the discomfort. And again, you can use containers to practice with the fear and discomfort. And I highly recommend using, using at least those focus containers. I think they are a real powerful way to allow yourself that, the ability to just practice with that discomfort in a, man, in a manageable chunk. As you progress in learning, you'll realize that all of this stuff is connected. All of, of computing is connected together. Uh, languages borrow heavily from each other. Um, I mean, there are concepts that date back to the 1950s, uh, especially if you start talking about Lisp. I mean, Lisp, I think, is like the Ur language. You know, it's like the proto-language for all, all of computing nowadays. But rather than dissuade us, it should encourage us that even if you're learning just a small part, you're that much further on learning the rest of it as well. And you can open up a lot of doors by learning some simple transferable concepts. So I like to think of influences. Um, as, as a person of a musical bent, I like to think about influences. So there's an artist named Webb Wilder who did a cover of Big Joe Williams' Baby Please Don't Go. And he talks about you know meeting Big Joe Williams. So the first time I was like, oh, who's Big Joe Williams? So I went out and I picked up a, a you know, a big Joe Williams Apple album. Actually, I picked up two of them and that. So if you want some Mississippi blues, big Joe Williams, awesome. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of metalheads learned who Joe Jackson was when Anthrax did a cover of Got the Time, um, to which I say, yes, I asked my band to do a cover of Got the Time beforehand. They said, oh, that's not metal enough. So ha ha. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so languages are in a lot the same way. So musicians, have influences that will guide them. You know, that's like, okay, you know, I, I like Neil Peart. I like all these different drummers and whatnot. So that influenced my musical practice. And programmers, again, you know, I, when I found out that JavaScript was influenced by Scheme, what did I do? Naturally, I learned Scheme because 
learning JavaScript was hard, and I wanted to learn something fun. So <laughs> that's that's why we had a presentation about skiing. <laughs> So again, look at the influences and where all this stuff comes from, because it is all connected. Be curious. Um, and I can't stress this hard enough and highly enough, because as beginners, we engage with the computer not really knowing what we were going to expect. You know, you turn that thing on, and for my, my era, it was you, you turn on a computer and the ready prompt shows up. It's like, ready. We're ready to go. What are you going to do? Okay? Type in whatever it is you want to do. And as we mature as programmers, we trade a lot of our curiosity for, uh, for certainty. You know, we want things to work a particular way. We want things to be concrete. And we trade a lot of our enthusiasm for expectations. And the problem is that the excitement that we got from, you know, being able to, you know, being in front of all these anything, anything machines becomes drudgery. You know, as you keep learning, it's like, okay, you know, I remember when I was doing Pascal. You know, oh, you know, after a while it started becoming a little more drudgery. It was, you know, okay, we've got to do the procedure, we've got to do this, we've got to do the function and that. And it's like, no, I just want to program. I just want, I don't want to have to dic dictate all this stuff. So, but we can recapture a lot of that beginner spirit by understanding each opportunity is an opportunity to learn and a new experience for us. We can drop our expectations of how things are supposed to go, you know, what we feel that, you know, how our experience is supposed to be. Instead of worrying about that, we can just say, okay, I'm just going to take it as it is, and I'm going to work through this. And that'll help us rekindle a lot of our spark. I'm going to talk a little bit about emotions. A lot of us, when we program, you know, we're, like, very stoic. You know, we're supposed to be behind the keyboard, you know, busily typing away. Got that, that furled brow thing going, you know, tapping away at this. We're supposed to be emotionless, and we are anything but emotionless. I know whenever I'm programmer, and whenever I'm programming, I'm like a conductor. I'm swearing at the computer. I'm throwing things away at it. I have broken so many machines. I, you know, I, I, I am I am very angry programmer. But so we have a lot of emotions when we're programming, and it's taxing. Uh, you know, you can start the day. You know, all happy, ready to go. By mid-afternoon, everything's going horribly wrong. But then, you know, triumphantly after lunch, you manage to, you know, make everything work again. And it's just this roller coaster sometimes when you're programming of just all these different emotions. And our emotional state can mirror what we're feeling about whatever we're creating. Whether we're stuck, we're excited, we're bored. You know, whatever that attitude is about whatever it is that we're creating, and whatever our emotions are about whatever it is that we're creating, that's going to be mirrored in whatever we're doing. So, and if we start adding stuff like insecurities, uh, fears, doubts, that can be a lot of burnout. That can, you know, all those emotions can lead to burnout. So, what do we do with that? Well, things, one thing that we can do is we can first recognize the things that affect our emotions. So, I alluded to a few of these. Purpose and utility. Is what, the, it, is what we are working on right now something that is useful? Is there a purpose to what it is that we're doing? There is no quicker way for me to burn out than something that is completely pointless. If there is something that is absolutely no point to what it is that we're doing, I'm just going to bounce right off of that. You know, so it needs to have some kind of a purpose. Are we engaged or are we bored? Are we actually learning something off of this or are we doing something that we've done several times over? You know, are we, are our, our synapses filled with delight or are we just going through the motions on this? This is another big one. Are we awake or are we tired? I can't tell you how many times I have, you know, woken up, felt very tired and whatnot, and my day just drags completely. And, I'm, you know, I start getting very anxious about it, what it is that I'm working on. I start getting upset with what it is that I'm working on because it's not happening as quickly as I want it to happen. So awake versus tired is a really big, uh, big one for me. So being aware of what our emotional and mental state is, is very important. And I'm using mental state here to cover a lot of ground, um, whether it's engagement, burnout, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, or any other medical factors that may come into play. Because programming takes a lot of mental bandwidth. You're keeping a mental model of an entire system in your head. 
and it's competing with all the other different emotions that you have going on inside of your head. And so emotional triage is a way to just sit back and realize and recognize what it is that's going on at that particular moment. And then not necessarily try and change it. I mean, I use triage in the sense of like a medical professional who's coming in, seeing what it is, you know, that's come in front of them and say, okay, this is what's going on right now. And now I need to redirect where, where it is that it needs to go. So we need to understand what got us to this point and how we got to that emotional state. So a lot of us tell stories. I know I'm a really good storyteller. I know you're all pretty good storytellers as well. The story is that story that you have in your head that tells you how that day is going. You know, whether you're, you know, feeling really good about what it is that's going on right now. You're probably even telling stories about yourself, about me right now. But uh, when we're feeling amazing, we tell ourselves an amazing story. Hey, you know, I'm the, I'm the protagonist that can do anything. If we're feeling down and defeated, well, that's a totally different story altogether now, isn't it? The truth is, though, that our stories are just stories. They're just things that we tell ourselves in our head. It's all fiction. You know, it, it, even if we're saying, you know, oh, I'm, I'm having a great and amazing day, things may be on fire around me, but it's like, hey, I'm having a great day, you know, no problem. <laughs> it's not a guarantee of how the day will progress. So you can tell yourself a better story uh, or the gift of refocusing on the, per on the present. So focusing on the, on the present a lot, gives us the freedom to recalibrate how our day is going and as the day progresses. So something even as simple as my computer booted this morning can be a positive story that we can tell ourselves or a positive moment that we can tell ourselves. Some days that may even be a miracle. I know some arch users out there may be, you know, oh, my computer booted. Sorry, that's a little low. <laughs> but we can course correct throughout the day and navigate toward a more productive day. One thing that emotional triage can help us alleviate is burnout. And burnout is a real big topic uh, for folks you know, in a programming profession. There's a lot of people that are burning out on a day-to-day -day basis. Burnout can be something very simple. It can be something like I'm bored at work or I'm overworked at work. Burnout can also lead to medical uh, complications, physical or mental complications, if you're not careful. So we can work ourselves into serious levels of exhaustion if we're not careful. So the idea is to recognize, if you do an emotional triage and figure out what it is that you're feeling at that moment, you can then pull away from the spiral of burnout. It's not part of the dues that we, that we need to pay as programmers. Burnout is not a guarantee. So It is tricky to self-diagnose, though. Uh, some people may, may tell you, you know, you're, you're looking like you're burned out. You may, you know, you may be burning out. It's tricky to diagnose, though, because it is a lot of unrelated emotions. And I know for myself, uh, it's feelings of boredom, fear, exhaustion, anxiety. They all have different root causes and whatnot. But when we combine them together into an unrelated, unrelenting work schedule and loss of control, those feelings get amplified very quickly. So, and those can also lead to things where you start wanting to stop programming altogether. You know, you want to quit want to go become a farmer, you know, some of us want to do that. But you can cause yourself all sorts of undue suffering by just powering through all of that burnout. So, and that can, that can compound and complicate an emotional state. So one way to alleviate burnout is acknowledge that you're about to burn out. You know, if you're on a collision course with the ground, Probably a good idea to start yanking on that yoke a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, that may seem simple, though, but we tend to ignore a lot of those symptoms. You know, it's like, oh, well, maybe it'll get better. Maybe the, the project will go a lot better. But you need to recognize you're about to burn out um, so that you can course correct for that. Another way is to examine your emotions. So you sit quietly and just feel those emotions and feel what comes to you. Again, emotional triage. Uh, are you feeling stress, fear, anxiety, nervousness, anger, any of those sort of things? Just notice those. Just sit and notice what it is that you're feeling. And if you can, figure out where those are coming from inside of you. Figure out the texture 
of it. I mean, people talk about texture and you know location and all that kind of stuff, and that sounds like a lot of hogwash. But there is a little bit of a texture to it, a little bit of a feeling to that. So, give yourself permission just to pull back a little bit and just realize what you're feeling. Many times, the burnout is a result of overcommitment. I'm not sure if anyone in here is overcommitted. Uh, you know, you're all just you're perfectly fine on this stuff. You probably don't need to worry about this. But yeah, it means result burnout is a result of overcommitment. And one thing that you may want to do is try and renegotiate some of those commitments as you are able to do so. You know, maybe you don't need to be on 15 different committees. Maybe you don't need to be doing, you know, 15 different open source projects that are all high pressure, high stakes projects. Maybe you need to cut back on some of those things. Whatever the reasons, though, you may need, you just figure out what you need to reevaluate and figure out if those are things that you want to be working on, if those are things you want to be doing uh, with your life. And if you see that you've created an intractable situation, then go through and renegotiate those and feel if you can, uh, figure out how to cut away some of those obligations and renegotiate. Give your drive a rest. So unlike our mechanical counterparts, like the computer in front of me, they cannot usually work a straight eight or more hour. We cannot work a straight eight hour day. We need breaks. We need moments where we can pull back from all this stuff. And again, programming requires a lot of mental bandwidth. You got that mental model of the code in your head. And pushing yourself to, an, to exhaustion is just going to give yourself emotional instability, stress, and burnout. Need to figure out this is how you want to live your life. So if you are constantly working a whole lot of hours, um, if you're not happy with what you're doing every moment and what you're doing with this stuff, then you need to re renegotiate what it is that you're doing and whether this is the way that you want to live your life. If you look deep in yourself and you find nothing but dread whenever you're thinking about coding, it's probably a good idea to stop coding, you know? Uh, or at least renegotiate some of the commitments they have related to coding. So it may be as simple, something as simple as agreeing to not to do not to do something right now, uh, or it could be finding different work, changing your career. Uh, those are all options. This is hard. This is really hard to do, um, but it is okay to ask other people for help. And the reason is um, that it's hard is because when we're not really trained how to ask for help. We come kind of pre-wired to ask for help. You know, when you start off as a child, your way for asking for help is to cry, wave your arms, you know, do all that kind of stuff. But I know whenever I would ask for help in certain projects, it'd be like, you need, you should know this. You should know this. I, I hate when I ask for pe people for help and it's like, you should know this already. That is like the worst line for me. Um, other times I thought that it would diminish my reputation and it's like, okay, you know, I'm supposed to be this, this magnificent, wonderful, awesome senior programmer and I can't figure out how to get this stupid thing to work. Um, so yeah, sometimes I worry that I'd be exposed as a fraud or an imposter. Um, but when I did ask for help, usually the response that I got was not, you know, why you didn't, you should know this by now. It was, why didn't you ask for help sooner? That's usually what people will say. So the benefits of asking for help usually outweigh the negative. And a lot of that is just dropping your ego and dropping you know, the, the perfect, wonderful, gifted <coughs> programmer that we all think that we are and drop that for a second. Or, or the, uh, you know, the horrible programmer that we think they are back here, you know, the imposter or whatnot. Just drop all of that and it's like, I'm just here trying to figure stuff out. Help me. Asking for help also isn't just technical help. Um, there are many ways that folks need help. Uh, that may be, you know, asking folks for help with personal issues that we have on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, hey, I'm going through a rough patch right now. I need some help. Um, that may also be medical professionals uh, who may be able to prescribe different things for helping out. You know, it's like, hey, my, my brain weasels are going into full bore. I need some help, you know. Uh, so asking friends, asking loved ones, whole other sorts of uh, support staff, um, those are all folks that are in your corner. Use them as much as you're able to. 
And again, there's a reluctance in asking for help because it puts us in a, in a place of uncertainty when we're uncertain about the outcome. Vulnerability, and vulnerability. Yes, exactly. You know, we're uncertain about the outcome and how people may perceive us, you know, and we run away from that discomfort rather than asking folks for help uh, because there's a lot of fear. There's, you know, there's the fear, there's danger ahead or whatnot. But embracing that discomfort, we can allow ourselves to get the help that we need so that we can do our best work. And again, I alluded to this earlier because I forgot about this slide. Uh, asking for help is a skill, and skills are something that we can practice. So as we ask for help, we, pr we allow ourselves the ability to practice with asking for help and we get better at asking for help, okay? So it's not something that comes naturally, like I mentioned before, but with repetition, we can learn it. Asking for help is a skill, so think of it as a skill that you can learn and that you can build upon, and that'll help you out. He said help. None of us likes to think about giving up. None of us likes to think about giving up. But for some of us, uh, you know, I know when I was, when I first learned about computers, that was uh, what all I wanted to do was work on computers. But there were also times where I thought about quitting uh, and giving up. Uh, I wondered if one of the career tests that I took was, was right. Maybe I should have been an agricultural engineer. Uh, you know, it, it took one of those uh, moist tests. I filled it out as carefully as I could and whatnot because I thought that was the way that I was going to be, you know, tell it, oh, I'm going to be a programmer. Yeah, I came back farmer. So, of course, I hacked the test afterward. <laughs> so, yeah, there's sometimes where you worry about uh, quitting. One thing to realize is that programming is more than the job market. The job market has a very narrow set of skills that it is looking for. Um, that's why people still ask if COBOL is useful in, uh, in 2019. And for a lot of companies, it is still useful. But is it something that you're going to find a lot of joy in doing? I don't know. That's something that you're going to have to answer for yourself. If you only learn what is marketable, you're going to pigeon yourself, pigeonhole yourself in a lot of narrow subset of skills. And I, honestly, to me, the job market, the stuff that they're asking for in the job market is not terribly interesting. I mean, there are interesting things over at Ford with AI and all this other kind of stuff, but sometimes it's, it's just not that interesting. Sure, there's a lot of companies adopting cool new things like machine learning, um, natural language processing, all this other stuff, but eventually that stuff will become boring and routine as well. I mean, I remember when Perl was the big new hotness and whatnot, and now it's just routine. I don't think there's a whole lot really happening in that area. Please correct me if I am wrong, though. Number 27 on the most popular language. Is it really? Number 27? I'm surprised it's that high. Exactly. At 27, how do you know? Anyways, so yeah, don't let businesses decide what you're going to learn. Uh, they have their own agendas. So figure out your own agenda and what you'd like to learn and what's going to keep you interested in the game. Part of the joy of programming is curiosity. So if you can tap into the curiosity, you, then you have a lot more avenues to explore. So there's always topics and ideas to discover. And, and there's things you know like game development, which I find very interesting. Uh, esoteric languages. So if you want to learn you know, one of those esoteric languages out there, go and do so. Uh, other programming paradigms. You know, functional programming is kind of interesting. There's another one that I just heard recently, I don't remember off the top of my head, that was like, they, they were using machine learning, it looked like, to do, uh, I, I'll, have to, I'll have to look it up later on, but it was really wild what they were trying to do with machine learning and programming. I think it was a new function in Swift, uh, was where I heard about it. Anyways, there's also old computing uh, can be very interesting as well. Emulators, retro computing uh, can be very fascinating. I mean, I've been intrigued with learning how APIC computers work because they're very simple machines, but there's a lot of concepts in there that are still being used today. Um, and they're also pretty well understood as well. Um, so that may be something to check out as well. So do whatever you need to do in order to give yourself joy in programming again. You know, Marie Kondo, spark joy. Um, but when the spark is gone, 
then you need to realize and understand why you're feeling that way. Part of it may be that you're being, you're feeling tired when that you've been through a project that sapped the living soul out of you. Um, been on those, those are fun. Or maybe you found that the communities are hostile um, or not fun to be around, they're unwelcoming. Uh, maybe we thought that programming was going to be a head rush at all times because it was a head rush early on and now it's not quite a head rush anymore uh, because we got a job doing that thing that we love. You know, it's no greater way to suck the, full, the fun out of something than get a job in it. <laughs> <laughs> but programming is something that's best done when you want to do it. It's not something that you can really force yourself to do. Uh, so if you're stuck in a situation where you don't really want to do it anymore, then it is perfectly reasonable to step away uh, from it all and give up. There's no shame in that. But remember, though, that programming is only one facet of your life. You're a multidimensional human being. There are many things that make you, you. So it may be a big facet. I mean, for me, if, I, if you took away the programming, I think I'd probably be about 60% gone. Um, <laughs> there's a lot to it. But if we examine our feelings and realize that we're just going through the motions, then maybe it's time to quit. Uh, if we're no longer fear, feeling any joy, then maybe we need to figure out something else to do. We're only granted a limited amount of time here, folks. Sorry to say. So doing something meaningful with your life, uh, whether that be programming or something else, uh, is something that you need to figure out. It's also, you're okay to stop being a programmer, whether it's temporarily or permanently. Sometimes we all need a break from this stuff, you know, figure out what it is that we want to do with our lives. Um, it's hard enough. So just maybe take a break from programming, explore other interests, um, you know, figure out if you want to take up that circus career, you know, mm -hmm. that you've always been talking about, play around with that. Uh, maybe it's a permanent position. The thing is with, uh, like with tours, with bands, you know, it's like, oh, this is the final, final, final tour, wow. you know, except except when the rent comes due, you know, and then it's the final, 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 final tour. <clears throat> this It doesn't necessarily have to be permanent. You can decide on how temporary or permanent that is, but maybe sometimes you need just to, need to take a break from it. The best path for you is the one that you make yourself, regardless of where it may lead. Now, naturally, I hope you can continue programming because I think it's fun, but it's entirely up to you. Your journey is unique. You're going to have a journey that I can't share, and I have a journey that some of you will not be able to share unless you get a time machine. Um, but it's all going to be unique. You're all going to have a unique journey. Um, none of our experiences are more valid than the others. They're all just different. So my experiences, you know, growing up with an Atari 800, learning Pascal, going to college for this stuff, going to the automotive industry, you know, et cetera, it's different. You're all going to have different experiences. Um, they're just experiences. So the areas that of knowledge that you have are just the areas that you explored so far. So go out and explore some different areas if you want. There will always be gaps, but those are the only the areas that you haven't explored yet. I wish you well on your journey, and I hope to hear your tales when we meet again. So until we meet again, I'd like to thank you and remind you that there is a book that you may also read as well. Uh, it goes into a lot more detail. Uh, some of this is reflected in there. Uh, some of it's got better language than what I've got here. Um, so yeah, check it out and uh, let me know how you think about it. Um, let me tell you the story. Well, first off, uh, thank you everyone. <laughs> Let me tell you the story of where this domain name comes from, because it's both sad and awesome at the same time. Uh, so I was laid off from my job in 2016. And of course, they mentioned uh, at the time, oh, you're a programmer. You'll be able to get a job really quick, which is like a curse, in my humble opinion. Uh, if you ever want to tell someone, you know, oh, you're, you're going to feel horrible about not getting a job right away. Oh, you'll get a job real quick. Yeah. So I spent the entirety of 2017 uh, looking for work and got pretty much fed up with it around April. And after an interview where I did one of those lovely coding tests, asked me about coding tests sometime, um, 
and did horribly on it. I, I registered that domain because I figured that if I was going to be a screw up, I was going to own it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So after a while, I, I had always wanted to write a book, a self-help book, kind of about programming and about the emotions of programming. And so it all coalesced together because I'd just been through a really horrible time uh, in my programming career. And so I decided to sit down for 10 minutes a day and write the containers that I talked about. And so that became uh, the entirety of the book. Um, and so it's out there, and you may tear it apart as you wish. I also wrote it in a, uh, on, uh, speaking of GitLab, so there's a project in France called Framasoft. Framasoft. I don't know exactly how you pronounce it in French, but I'm going to pronounce it in, Eng in anglicized French. <laughs> Framasoft. And uh, so I was on Framagit, and uh, <laughs> which is basically a GitLab instance. And that uh, I put it as private, and I figured that no one would look for it there. So I could write in, in, in secret and whatnot. And then I could get uh, various folks to sign up for an account over there and give me review feedback as necessary. So there have been a lot of people also that have helped me out with this. Um, Bo Sheldon, I, I asked to help out with the uh, the last chapter on um, about mental illness and PTSD and the emotions of programming in that because I'm, I, I'm very neurotypical, so I don't have those experiences, so I wanted to get someone who had those experiences as well. And again, Dave Overbois did the, the cover, and my mom has been busily editing it. <laughs> That's the joys of being an English teacher and having a son that wants to write. <laughs> so there you go. Yes, questions? A couple of times people have asked me uh, what programming language, they want to learn pro to program and what language they should start with. Mm -hmm. And, and they, they, they were doing it for hobbyist things, not as young people looking to build a career. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest as the one you do? The, the one that interests you. The one that interests you. And the reason, the reason being is I think they're all good on ramps. You know, Yeah. I, I told him, well, you know, I just tried Python. There's so much online about how to, how to learn to use it and stuff like that. But I, I don't, I, so I, I usually recommend Python because it's, it's, it's easily available. The thing is, with all these languages, they're all on ramps to a programming career. Even the bad ones are an on ramp uh, because they teach you stuff like Boolean logic, they teach you variables. And um, to a certain extent, someone will teach you object-oriented programming and functions. So most of the, the modern languages out there are, are pretty good at least giving you some of the fundamentals. Now, some of them are better than others. Um, I mean, some folks would say JavaScript is a really good language to learn as well. I'm not sure I would agree, but for a lot of folks, that really works out for them. So I would, I would recommend whatever gets you in front of a computer and programming and doing interesting things is the language that I would recommend using. I think, I think Python has a very low barrier to entry. It does. It does have a low barrier. One or two lines you can see output. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. And maybe yes. you can do more like a computer programming book that's agnostic, that gives different use cases for different types of programs. Like I don't know the totality of all this stuff. I, I have <laughs> I bought most of the books. I've not bought all the books. <laughs> <laughs> Have you read the books? Well? No, that's the problem. That's the problem. You know, I'm really good at. at when are you having a book sale? When am I having a book sale? Uh, it's available online. So I chose a Creative Commons license for it. Um, no, I meant of your library. Oh, it's PDFs. That's the problem. You can't exactly sell PDFs. Um, but yeah, I, I chose the Creative Commons license for the book and that because I want people to get those ideas. And also partly because um, Leo Babauta, uh, who I admire greatly, put all of his stuff as under an uncopyright, which is basically putting it under public domain because nobody owns the ideas. So I wanted to follow along that. But of course, I also put it as a, I think it was by attribution. I don't think I did by attribution share alike. But Do you have any physical copies? Or? Not yet. It's still editing. Uh, in fact, you can see a little notation on the last chapter where you'll see a little fix me that'll move from time to time down, down the list because that's where I'm editing at the moment. So I'm still editing it. Yes? So looking for tips. Uh, I, I go for walks, right? 
Yeah. Going out to a search engine and typing in the word kittens helps. Yeah. And then at work, they bought all kinds of ping pong tables, thinking that would like make everybody really happy. Yes. Which is really good for all the people who really get ping pong. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, tips on tips on taking a break. Um, honestly, anything that gets you away from your desk, like I at my previous job, I would walk around the building. Um, that was most of the time. That was really good. Sometimes it's not so good when it's you know winter time, and you have to put on your jacket and whatnot. Um, but even just wandering around, you know, your workspace, you know, I work from home. So sometimes I'll, I'll go down to the basement and just pace around back and forth and whatnot. But that's, that's what I recommend is just some way that you can get away from your desk and give yourself that context switch. Yes. Yeah. 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 Richard, you had something? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in a group that, uh, that uh, is a group of programmers. But some of the things you talked about, like asking for help and stuff, and this group in the past has discussed what they call agile programming. Mm -hmm. And that really gets down to a lot of asking for help and interacting and working as a team. Yeah. And there, there's a, uh, a video I saw in Ann Arbor uh, well, from Ann Arbor YouTube video, mm -hmm. saw a lot of company where they everything is done with peer programming. Yeah, two people in front of one screen and they're helping each other. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, in our group, one of the guys was talking about uh, uh, how they work, and the group of about five people get together in the morning uh, without the boss, and they. Each of them make a statement. What they accomplished yesterday, what their goal is, goals are for today, mm -hmm. and their block, the problem that's holding them up that they don't know how to conquer. Right. And when they mention that, somebody in the group is going to be able to come up with an answer to help them. Yeah. It's called a stand up. Yeah, stand up meetings. Yeah. No, those are those are all those are all systematized ways of doing a lot of this stuff. But I don't think you need necessarily to go through a whole systematized approach. Even if you have some just, you know, even even a, like a weekly group that meets on Wednesdays over at a coffee shop, you know, <laughs> might be some way to do that. Or a group that meets on the second Tuesday of the month, you know, maybe a way to do that. Just be careful to systematize. Yes. Is No Starch Press the company that's publishing it? No. They, um, I asked them about it. Uh, they declined. So I'm self-publishing it myself. Yes. Speaking of looking at rectangles, yes. the best thing I ever discovered was a very cool technology called filtering glasses or blue filters or whatever vision you can look at all the specs. Blue blockers, yeah. Input. Whatever lens you're looking for, they're all very different. Um, the best thing I ever did for my eyeball, my, my head, and my sanity was to get a really nice pair of like minor belief that put like blue filtering glasses. And my eye strain went to zero. Um, yeah. And, and also, um, proper turning, proper posture. So whatever your body needs for proper posture, proper shoulder alignment, wrist alignment, limited RSI, having a decent keyboard. Yeah. But my eyeballs, man, are, are awesome now. I was I was getting ready to to not need a computer screen before I got those things. My eyes are <laughs> so bad. So. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Nice. Ask me about my bone glands. How I <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yeah. You briefly mentioned imposter syndrome. Yes. Yes. Uh, I know personally, uh, I felt like an imposter until I started hiring other devs. Yes. Uh, and then I was like, oh, okay, everybody's got struggle. I've been yeah. programming for 35 years. I still. Yeah, yeah no. Yeah. No, imposter syndrome is a very common. Yeah. Do you have a personal 
personal payout or anything? Uh, well, <laughs> like a point where you I, felt like you... I have an entire job that I felt completely out of my depth. Uh, so I worked for SourceForge from 2008-ish to 2009-ish. And let me tell you about imposter syndrome. When everyone on the team is much better than you are, uh, yeah, I felt completely out of my depth. I felt like everyone hated me on there. I felt like I was going to lose my job at every opportunity. I felt like my manager, every time that my manager pinged me, it was going to be like, here's where you screwed up. And so I was always on edge the entire time that I was there. And I think a lot of us, I mean, I, I still feel that today. If I get an email from my client, I just feel like, oh my God, I, I've, I have, yeah, no, this is it. No, totally. And how many of the this is it have you actually gotten? Uh, not very, you know, I've gotten a few. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not infallible, yeah. but <laughs> that I have, I have definitely. Oh, no, totally, yeah. totally. You know, and, then, and there are times where I will publish something or something like that, and I, you know, it's like I'm, I'm expecting at any moment to get the, the issue that says you destroyed my computer and ruined my life. You know, it's like it, 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 it doesn't really go away. The, that's the thing. I should say it only goes away when you realize that you are not alone in all this stuff. I remember reading a developer. She works over at Microsoft now. She worked on NPM. You know, which some of you may have heard of NPM. Yeah, exactly. And and she mentioned that she feels in, imposter syndrome as well. And I was like, what? You know, and there are a number of folks. It's like really, really very skilled developers in that, people that I would look up to and admire, who are like, I, I feel imposter syndrome all the time. Sure. And it's like, yeah, it's, we're, we're all struggling. And that's, I think part of, the, part of the thing that is eye-opening for folks is realizing that programmers, we're all struggling with this stuff. Nobody comes into learning programming fully formed, ready to go, you know, you're, they're just, they're all, we're all learning. We're all learning at different speeds. We're all learning different things. So the sooner you can realize that we're all in this together and we're all learning this stuff, I think the happier you're going to be, or at least the more satisfied you're going to be. Maybe not happy, but satisfied. <laughs> and the more you'll be able to, to tamp down those, those feelings of, of, I don't belong here. You know, and I think that's, that's a lot of what, what uh, imposter syndrome does is like, I don't belong here. I have, they are going to find out at any moment that I am a fraud, that I managed to snowball them enough in the rigorous interview process that I went through that I am, I am incapable of doing this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what I was talking about with gaps in that is because you, you're constantly trying to fill in those, those gaps. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's actually a good thing. Mm hmm. Yeah. It's good to know what you don't know. Yeah. There's people that are imposters. They don't care. So, yeah, they don't even know what they don't know. Are there any other questions? Comments? Yes. I have an observation. It's not a universal principle, but another expert in the field, but I'm just kidding, said you never know where you're going until you get there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, and that's it. It, it is a journey. It is a journey. Yes. So I mentioned the buying every single book with the idea that you're going to read all this stuff and, and the idea that you are, yeah. I, <laughs> that is also another thing uh, where you, you set yourself up as I'm going to learn the totality of this particular thing. I am horrible at goal setting. I am very bad at goal setting. If I try and do a long-term goal like six months from now, I'm going to screw it up. I know I'm going to screw it up. So that's why I think in more terms of I'm going to try and do this for this particular week. Because I can think in a week. I don't necessarily think very well in a month. And I'm pretty sure that by a year that whatever I think now is going to be completely off the rails by the end of it. And I think that's – so you, if you set your sights 
shorter and don't try and create these grand plans for how your life is going to go because they won't go very well that way. I think that's going to help out with a lot of that. But yeah, you're very right on the whole idea of not being unrealistic. Like I, I've heard so many people come up to me and say, I am going to write Doom. I'm going to write the, you know, the Doom game or something like that. And it's like, okay, you're, you're in for a lot of work. And there are some folks who are very good at, you know, they will figure all this stuff out. They will go through and do all the work. And there are a lot of folks for whom they're, they're going to struggle with that type of a goal. Yeah, no, they're, they're going to struggle with that goal. And it's like, I, I'm not necessarily going to tell you which person you are, because there are, you know, some folks are very capable of doing this stuff. But yeah, you need to know where it is that you're at and what your gaps are in order to figure out what you're capable of doing in that. And imposter syndrome can definitely contribute to that and can create that feedback loop where you're saying to yourself, okay, I, I should be, I should be uh, John Carmack by now because of all the stuff that I put in, all the effort that I put in. And it's like, no, there's, you, you may have set yourself for, up for an unreasonable expectation. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember which one, but it was a guy who was like, I just got this new gig, this guy's got hundreds of domains and wants like hundreds of pages, and he's telling me it should be like page every three hours. Yeah. And like, the guy's freaking out because he's like, I don't know if I can meet that, like, what's going on? And like, the first dozen comments are like, that's a scam, keep yeah. it wrong, don't doubt yourself that much, get out mm -hmm. of there, like, that's crazy. Yeah got to also, you know, know what's reasonable, right? you got mm -hmm. to kind of figure that out yourself and talk to other people. So yeah. On chat rooms and stuff like that. I have found my, myself, I am most invincible when I'm doing estimates. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can do anything in the world. I can do anything. When it's it's coming time to estimate. You know, it's like, oh, I can do that in two hours. You know, it's like name that tune. I can do that in one note, you know. It's like, no, I can't. I cannot do that. And I need to remind myself that I cannot do this stuff and be reasonable with myself. You know, it's like there's there's all these tricks. It's like, oh, well, if you think you can do it in two hours, give yourself four hours or eight hours or something like that. And it's like that's still I, I may as well be writing fiction at that point because I don't know how this is all going to go. So. Any other questions, comments? All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And with that, 